you went sh in my yard. Wait, 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 wait. I love you. Daddy, chill. What the hell is even that? You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Mic check, mic check, testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. Guys, I know I have severe ADHD and I should actually plan this shit out, but that's why for these live streams, I don't. I just completely wing it. And sorry, this is so last minute, but that's why we call it last minute lives. Uh, This last minute live, we have a really cool guest. This is a dude that I had the privilege of, of really getting to know in college fishing against, I think, the revered, the vaunted uh, Adrian College. I believe they are the New York Yankees of the time uh, of the college fishing world. I mean, they were always ranked like number one. I don't know if they were flying in talent from like Puerto Rico or whatever, but they always were able to get like the shit. And then this individual comes from a landlocked nation of Ohio and somehow he can go to tidal water anywhere. And he has this instinctual like tune. He can feel the water and he always catches them there. We got Jared Martin, Adrian College and Potomac River. Um, I don't know. Connoisseur. How are you doing tonight, bud? Good, Thomas. How are you, man? I'm doing wonderful again. Yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, I think I, I really just to tell everyone at home, like, yeah, who are you and how did you get your start in this this crazy sport? Uh, my name is Jared Martin. I am from Gallup Police, Ohio, originally. Uh, I fished back in high school. My freshman year at Galley Academy was the first year for high school fishing in the state of Ohio. So I started in there, uh, kind of got my feet wet, started learning some stuff, started moving, moving my way up, fishing different bodies of water. Uh, from there, I went to Adrian College, which I fished with them for four years. Uh, awesome is all I can say. The experiences I had up there, uh, man, just incredible. Uh, from there, I graduated. I moved to Florida for a little bit, and then shortly after, moved back to Ohio. And I currently now reside in Mansfield, Ohio. And you guys were like part of like how many national champions? Like, I mean, just like go FLW first, then Bass, I guess, because like you you fish both sides, correct? Uh, yeah, I fish both sides. I fished uh, FLW more than I fish Bass, I would say. Okay, okay, because yeah, I remember. I God, I think I we started uh, really knowing you guys. I think it was that year. I think it was Indian that year where we came in second. Yeah, I, I think because that, that the second. Yes, you're right. We did. Yeah. Oh my God. I completely forgot about that part and that fantastic fishery. Like that was so oh amazing. God. I went back there this year actually for the first BFL of the season and it has not gotten any better. Oh my, like how, like I, this is a tangent, but this is what the show's for. How the hell do you grow up fishing those places and not get spun out? Because when we went there, it was like, good Lord, it's a tra- it looks like a New York freaking stop sign. Like there's so many boats packed into to such a tight area. Like that's gotta be like one reason you're so good at the Potomac. Man, right now is like it's even worse than what it used to be. I mean, it is literally chocked full of grass. It is topped out across the entire lake. Like you don't even see the water. You know, I mean, you literally just run across a grass flat the entire time. But I grew up on the Ohio River. I don't know if you've heard anything about it. Uh, it. There's really not too much to here. Uh, I mean, it is it is the toughest of the tough. I mean, catching a limit's tough ninety percent of the time. I mean, it is just an absolute grind. So. I mean, I guess coming from that and, you know, you can win a tournament out there five pounds, an eight hour, an eight hour tournament. If you have five, 12 inch fish, you can win quite a few of the events. So I guess just coming from something like that, like just where you just put your head down and you just either fish as many spots as you can. You beat up an area as hard as you can and you just you just put your head down and you just try to catch fish. So you get that grinding mentality, but then you guys were dominant damn near everywhere i mean it literally at least for that year it was you guys and like us were always in the top 10 and it didn't matter if we were like driving around like lake chautauqua us trying to find a deep water bite and i know i could find you flipping a dock somewhere if there was a dock i knew you were going to be at it Uh, but then but then you could go down to a tva lake and you were fine or or we could go to the blue black herring lakes and you were fine like how the hell did you get so versatile man i don't know if it was like a freshman just kind of like a freshman coming into it like everything just worked out well or what it really was. I mean, a lot of guys that we started with up at Adrian, I mean, that there was probably two of us, three of us 
that had really traveled, not even really around a lot, but they had gone to a couple of different states and fished a couple of different tournaments. So like they, we had a little bit of experience going out of there. The rest of the guys fished mainly Michigan for most of the time, but they were really good at fishing Michigan. And Michigan's an amazing fishery. So, yeah. you know, I mean, we, we just put our heads down and just fished as hard as we could. I mean, a lot of those places we'd never been to. Like, I live in Ohio, and I, that was the first time I've ever been to Indian Lake. Really? Okay. I so, like, I, I mean, it's not like I grew up there. I didn't. I lived, like, three hours from there in my hometown. So, man, I, you know, I don't know, like, like I said, I don't know if it was just new bodies of water, fresh mines, getting out there and whatever we found. I think it was just all that we had, you know? I mean, it wasn't like we had 40 different spots from years past that we could like run and bounce around to. I mean, it was whatever we had is what we had and that's what we were going to fish. And I think it would just worked out well for us. Uh, yeah, clearly it did. I mean, I mean, guys, like, I mean, just, just some of his stats, just from the FL, this is what I just found too, is like, uh, like 10, or nine top tens. You got two career wins. Of course, the big one last year, which I I, can, I guess it would be considered. Yeah, it's the All American, correct? And then that was your total winnings are over sixty eight thousand, which is insane. And then I just want to even talk about you went to, I believe it was four college national championships, correct? Just on the FLW side. Yep. All right. Plus the bass and what you were able to do over there, which basically meant every year you and Adrian College were in contention to win. And that's something I think is amazing compared to you know I had a background in baseball. You know, if you were a D1 school, you only competed in D1s. Right. Fishing, what's so cool is you guys are a powerhouse against Alabama, Penn State, the Deep South. And I think beside, until I met you guys, I didn't know Adrian even existed. And it's so cool how you guys built this insanely powerhouse system. Kind of go through it. Like, did they recruit you? Because I saw now that they actually recruit people and actually go out there and find them. Like, did they recruit you? Did you seek them out? And then how did you make the team? Did you need your own boat? Did you have to like have a fish off to actually make it to the tournaments? Going to Adrian is actually a pretty funny story. And I know Seth Borton, the head coach up there. I know he'll give me a hard time for telling it, but I got to. Um, I was committed to going to Middle Tennessee State University. I was going down there to do concrete management. And about th probably three to four months before I was leaving, I get a Facebook message from a guy named Seth Borden. He gives me some spiel about how he's starting a bass team up at Adrian College and they're fully funded and all this and that. And I, I'm looking at it and he doesn't have a profile picture. <laughs> so, then, so then I click on his account and he has two friends. And I'm like, this is such a scam. I block him immediately. <laughs> I don't even, even reply back. I just instantly block him. Oh my God. And then like a month or two goes by and like, I, I started kind of looking into it. Like it just kind of caught my interest and I've never, I mean, I heard of like Bethel and a couple of places like that, but I'd never heard of Adrian college. So I started looking and Seth Borton's the new head coach for the Adrian college bass fishing team. Huh? So I go back in my messages and I unblock him I'm like, Hey man, I'd love to come up and check it out. And he's like, all right, come on up. So I end up going up. I fall in love with it. Uh, I'm from a super, super small town. I mean, we're, we were basically considered a village back in the day because we didn't have, even have 5,000 people there. Like I graduated with less than 100. So going up there, I mean, there was only 2,000 students. So it pretty much worked out great for me to go up there. I mean, campus was only a block. Super personable. All your professors knew you, stuff like that. Mm. I mean, stuff that... I would fit in better than going to a lecture hall and sitting there with 200 other students, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it worked out great. I mean, and you said fully funded. So, and I just know this from like hearing from people from tech and stuff that you actually had to like have a fish off and then they kind of like restructured every single fall, the co-angler and angler, so to speak. Like, like how did that work with, with, with Adrian? Like did, did everyone get to go those couple of years to the big tournaments or did you guys have to do like internal tournaments to see who went? Uh, the first year we started with 10 people came in uh, in the fall. And by the end of that semester, we were down to six. So we, were, okay. we just had six. We had six guys left. And we had two school boats. And then Caleb Taylor had his boat. So there was our three boats. We had our six guys. We had everybody that we needed. So that first year, we went to every event. Wow. All six okay. of us. I mean, if there was an event that we were going to go to, all six of us went to it. What was your first college tournament like? My very first college tournament, I pretty much rolled over. I, I I believe it was the FLW Open down on Kentucky Lake. 
And oh in practice, I had some motor issues. I took it in to get worked on. They said, you're, you're good to go. So we're, we're sitting there blast off. And, you know, right there at Moore's, how it has the rocks that come up. We're sitting there, and they call my number. And I get up there, and I take off, and I get about 50 yards. And the motor just, whoa. Oh, God. So my, very, my first Dude. five minutes of being in a tournament in college. I have to troll all the way back and fish whatever that cove is right there just south of the ramp. And we fish it all day for like one fish or two fish. And then the next day we go out again with just a trolling motor. Then they call us and tell us that, oh, we got a boat here for you. So we go and get the boat. And of course, you know, you're young, you're dumb. You're like, I know I'm going to catch them. Like I can run 40 minutes down this lake and I'm going to pull into a spot and I'm going to whack 20 pounds. So mm. we jump in the boat, run all the way down there, we end up blanking for the day. Mm. So it definitely wasn't what I was expecting for my very first one. But then like, and then this is, I'm thinking is 2014. No, this is 2015 then, right? 2015. Yep. Okay. And then, so when was Indian Lake then? Cause I know that's when I met you. Was that your second tournament? Yeah. We went to, the first one was at Smith mountain. Okay. Yeah. 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 Back then, they took the top 15, remember? And they took us to that regional tournament. I forgot and then about that. First, Smith Mountain, I finished 16, missed the cut by one spot. Both the other Adrian teams made it. Then we went to Indian. Me and you tied for second. Yeah. And then we went to Chautauqua, and I got 16th again, one spot out of. Yeah. I think we got, like, I thought we were 17th or 15th, but yeah, we were right there. Cause you were right. That was a dock flipping tournament. I completely yeah. ignored that shit. Cause I was trying to find the damn small mouth. I, but Billy caught literally like a seven pounder in practice and we, we had a school fired and then guess what? We couldn't have him find him the day it happened to. <laughs> I mean, and then we went and we had two hours left of the day. We started flipping docks and we caught what we did. It's like, son of a bitch. We should have just done this the whole time. Man, it was, it, that place is insane. That dock oh fight God. is just incredible. It's it's fantastic, and that's like something else. Like how how did you get so good at docks? Because I could I, I, again, it was my brother and I would always say we could always find you and your partner. You were we knew because you'd be shirtless in practice, and we could always tell because you'd be near a dock somewhere and be like, "Yep, there they are." So, but like, how are you so good at docks? No matter where we are, whether it's Lake Kiwi or up at Chautauqua, man, in Ohio we don't really have docks, you know. So I really don't know what kind of came about that. I mean, I guess we fish creeks at home back in the day, and you know, you got to. Our, our rule was always put your bait where everybody else cannot put it and you'll get bit. Whenever mm -hmm. you're fishing five bites a day, hopefully you literally have to do everything in your power to give yourself the best possible chance of catching them. So that was more or less kind of, I guess the idea was put it where nobody else does. And gotcha. up in Michigan, everything's docks. I mean, every uh, okay. okay. So you go up there for a year. I mean, you, you get the hang of it. You catch on. Those guys, those guys are good at it. Like, I mean, I can, I can put my jig under a dock. I mean, I see guys up there that can skip things that you would never believe that they can actually skip. I mean, I know one dude who can skip a rattle trap under a dock. That's like, yeah, I mean, they're, they're impressive as can be at it. So I guess it was just watching them, learning on my own, trial and error, tinging, tinging, uh, pontoons and boat docks and, you know, giving them the, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go on to the next one. Hopefully you don't take it. Is is that something that you in college, you leaned on then as a strength or did that just naturally come about? Like that the dock became, like it seemed from the outside looking in that became your strength. I know, I think at, at Kiwi, like you guys did have a jerkbait fight going on. I know it's yeah. been a few years, um, but was how, how did that become a strength of yours? Like, did you just naturally say like, I'm just going to look for dock bites? Is that what you tried to do or or? It, it more or less seemed like with the with everywhere that I fished and every way that I did fish, it seemed like I could always figure out how to get better bites under dogs. Mm. Whether it be because they're pulling up to spawn or they're getting out of the shade or or they're getting out of the sun, excuse me, or going up into the shade or whatever it might be, it always seemed like docks would produce good quality fish. And you can always find fish shallow. And if I could pick between going out deep or going in shallow, I'm going shallow every day of the week. I mean, that's just, that's just how I am. Like I, mm -hmm. I like being able to see stuff I can cast at. I like only being in 
five foot or less of water. I just, I feel way more com comfortable doing that. And on Chautauqua, you know, I mean, there's not really a whole lot of natural bank. I mean, it's more or less just docks. Yeah. If you're going to fish shallow. You got to, you got to adjust to it. And it just seems like one of those things that I've just kind of gotten used to and gotten comfortable with and gotten the confidence in that I needed to, to do well. No. And that that's something too about playing to your strengths. And I see with a lot of high school anglers now, I mean, I guess everyone's a lot more learned than we were with technology and everything that's advanced, but you got to be able to play to your strengths like a hundred percent and take that with you. Oh shoot. We got a couple of good questions here. Who the hell Larry H whatever your hell your name is, Larry something is dock fishing different parts of the country. I'm going to assume you meant is dock fishing different in different parts of the country. Uh, well, we got a really good guy on for that. Uh, Jared, what do you think? Like, is dock fishing the same everywhere or is it change? Um, that's a pretty good question. I think it's pretty similar a lot of places. Now, I think your presentation might change and it might be different from place to place. I know whenever I was just at, out at the All American, it wasn't really the docks that you would target in New York or that you would target in the Potomac River or that you would target in Michigan. It was 14 foot docks that had uh, brush piles at the ends of them, you know, and those were the ones you were looking for. Like you could go down and flip all those docks and you'd have to wait and wait and wait for that jig to go all the way down to the bottom. But whenever you found the ones that had lay downs, they had fish on them. Mm -hmm. So yes and no, I think that you can still approach them the same. I just think that you would have, you might have to change things up a little bit, just make things a little bit different. No, that's, that's a, Larry, that's a really, really good question. Again, guys, could you, we, I know we got over 10 people watching. Could you guys all hit the like button here? I want to try to get this up. The last live stream we did, we had over 10 likes. I want to, I want to max that out and get past 10. If we do, we will have a grand prize giveaway brought to you by Jake's bait and tackle. Good thing that they don't know about that yet, but we'll surprise them with that. Um, we got one more question. We're getting to the next thing. Shane Flint, how many boats does college typically fund? I guess that depends. Oh, I'll tell you for Shenandoah, Jack and shit. Like, uh, I paid for everything, <laughs> but I think some colleges do have different budgets. Um, Jared, you said they had, you said two boats, I guess, when you first started, they, yeah, they, they had two boats then. Okay. And I believe they have maybe three to four now would be my guess. They might've just gotten rid of the Rangers. I know they just got a Skeeter FXR 20 and 21. Wow. They got some, That's yeah, they got some nice ones. But I mean, majority of the time, I would say that we probably try to send five to six boats, depending on where it is. You know, I mean, that's really what it comes down to. If it's a close event, I mean, Lake Erie, you know, we go to Lake Erie for those qualifying events. We'll have as many boats as we can possibly take 15, 16 Adrian teams show wow. up to fish those. Okay. But if we're going down to Pickwick or something like that, you know, it's not. It's easier just to send three boats or four boats. What is something that you've picked up at least, at least from, from college fishing all over the country? Are there some things that are, what are two things that are different and then two things that are like the same anywhere you go when it comes to dealing with fish? I know we're getting really deep here. Two. How about one? How about one? One of each. One that's the same that you feel like uh, for bass is constant. And then one thing it seems like it's very unique. That's constant, like whenever I go. Yeah. Like for me, I think blueback herring, like that is a very unique bite compared to like, I think the docks or something that's always the same. But I know you've gotten to fish more places than me. Like I've never gotten to really fish the TVA system as much. Right. Right. Um, like, is that just something where you have to go do it a couple of times just to get familiar with it? Yeah, and I'll be honest with you, I'm I'm still not really that good at it. Like I'm I I have trouble sitting behind the driver or sitting in the driver's seat and staring at my graph all day. I know guys that can go out and they'll do that for twelve hours and never mm -hmm. even pull a rod out. You know, I mean I, I see the first thing. It don't matter what it is, whether it's a shell bed, whether it's a rock pile, whether it's a stump or what whatever, I'm making a cast at it. Mm -hmm. Whether I can see fish on there or not, I'm pretty bad about just dying to make a cast at it my brother taught me that because he can just sit with a podcast in his ears and just drive and just and dude you i feel like you have nowadays you have to but my yeah. god i need some propothol or something in my system just to just yeah. be able to sit there and do it it's insane but yeah guys do it especially in those tva systems and, and 
I mean, I don't know. Like the TVA system is crazy, especially the college tournaments now. Because I saw one term. I don't know if you were in it, but it was like three hundred plus boats. I don't think like, I was in that one. Okay, because like maybe it was a high school event, but it's like holy shit. Like they had four hundred down at Pitt. Four hundred. Okay, okay. There's that one then. Yeah, that's insane. Nuts. I mean, like I don't know how you can get on a bite in a good rotation with that many boats, and, and that's something that you know I will say this personally because I don't have any sponsors that I do think they really need to adjust the college system. I really liked the multi-day tournaments. I liked having the regional. I liked it that it wasn't just a win and you're in because it you had to be consistent. And there was pride I really had, at least for me, when we got to be ranked in the top 10 because it meant we were consistent. It wasn't that we just got lucky one time. You had to show up. And I, I like that format because I think it gets you prepped if you want to make the jump versus this this one-time flash in a pan and you get to go to nationals. Um, yeah. Uh, see, I only had the regional one time. It was that mm -hmm. year we went to Chesapeake. And I, to this day, still tell people that, that I think that was the best system that they had. Take the yeah. top 15 from every event. If somebody's double qualified, you drop down to 16th or 17th, wherever, and make everybody, all 45 of those guys go and grind for it. You're, the, you're supposedly the best 45, right, out of that conference. Mm-hmm. You guys go and prove yourselves and prove who's who should be in it and who shouldn't. Yeah, because I remember at, I think it was at Lake Kiwi and they talked about it, like it was hard to to qualify multiple years in a row for nationals, like the way they had that system. And I bet you house money that's what happened. His parents bitched because it was too hard. Right. I mean, right. I you know, which I it sucked because I looked at you guys and a couple other schools and like, yeah, it felt like we were really good and i think it was there's another group i think it was from nevada or las vegas i think they came in like third at murray the year before and yeah they did well at kiwi thing too but again it was the same thing it's just no nothing people but they were just consistent you know you didn't have to swing the fence chico state i think is maybe chico state yeah. yeah 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 like one of the dudes literally i saw him on instagram he's he's a fly fishing guide in the bahamas now kennedy kincaid yes I yes as well yep. oh my god yeah Jesus yep. Christ, I'm getting old. Uh, yeah, my God. Yeah, guys, sorry about that. Just reminiscing a little bit about that stuff. But yeah, like college fishing, it is fun. I'm not like, and I know I'm already going to get lit up in the comment section later on. I'm not shitting. I just wish they'd improve it. I, I wish it was a better feeder system for the professionals. Like the biggest thing when I made the jump over is I felt like there were some things FLW, uh, I'm sorry, Major League Fishing did well. But I just wish they get back to it there. Um, yeah. and, it, and it served well because it forced us to go over the country because if we didn't fish all the tournaments, we wouldn't be in the running for a lot of things. And so it forced us to expand to new water. And honestly, this kind of get into our big topic for today. That helped you because you had to go to first the Chesapeake, which was well, that was a fun fishery. That was a fun oh. time that year. That was a nightmare. <laughs> that was a nightmare. That first day was rough at that, that event. How did you guys survive? Because I don't know how we did. I caught I I caught a keeper like the first, I don't know, 20 minutes of fishing. Ran over to what's that river that's over there on that side? Susquehanna. Susquehanna? Okay, you went to Susquehanna. Susquehanna. Okay. We ran over in there, caught a keeper right off the rip. Wind was blowing up, so it wouldn't let the tide go out. And it was just terrible. And then literally the very last minute, I watched the Bassmaster Elite Series that was out there just before. Aaron Martin won that one, yes. Aaron Martin's won it. And Gerald Swindle was fishing that big cone that I think a railroad track went over. Mm -hmm. and we, I was like, you know what? It's right there by the ramp. We might as well go hit the G-Man spot. We ran right up in there, and there was an Ohio State team blocking the entrance way up through there. Oh, shit. Telling us how the fish, they were going to start biting. So I was like, all right, that's I, I respect that. You guys were here. Like, it is what it is. And we're maybe 20 yards behind them. And there's this one lay down and, like, just one twig is sitting in the water. And I take a black and blue jig and I flip it right up on there and I pick up and pick up. And it gets right. I mean, I wasn't 10 foot from the boat. And we're in, like, two foot of water, if that. Mm -hmm. And I pick up and my line swimming right under the boat. And all I do is I set the hook up. I crank three times and I flip. Much as I do everything I can to get it in, it was a five pound largemouth. Oh my god! <laughs> right on the center compartment, right between the driver and the passenger seat. In my life, or my uh, my rain suit was sitting there, and the guy Jake, who was in the back, he grabbed my rain suit and threw it over top of it and pushed it in the bottom. 
He said, We're, we can't lose this one. <laughs> 15 minutes left it was it was insane truly how many did you have with that we only had two pounds or we only had two fish two fish jesus and we had like maybe six and a half seven pounds it had us in i believe eighth and i think we finished seventh i think we moved up one spot the next day you survived because there's only one school that did like that actually sacked them day one and then they bombed day two they blinked on the second day yeah yeah, I, that one was that was that was the worst title setup ever. And we went into that saying, like, we're just trying to survive. Yep. We're just going to win. We're going to I got we had one spot. We knew we could catch a monster and we were going to do that. Then fish smallmouth the rest of the day and just try to survive because there was no way in hell in that big flat bowl with the wind that you were going to yep. do well. And there were like two other big time tournaments going out of there, too, at the time as yep. well. I remember that, but like that really sets you up though. That's tidal fishing in a nutshell. And was that your first time experiencing tidal? Was that year? I was, that was my very first time ever going to a tidal body of water. And I really didn't even realize, like understand what the wind did. You know, like I never put two and two together that like, you know, if the wind's blowing up and the tide's supposed to be going out, it's going to hold that tide up and not let it come. So mm -hmm. like, I never even really like clicked with it. I was just like, man, they, they just won't bite today. Like that going on, I just can't figure out how to get him to bite. Like I have no idea why. Not knowing, you know, I mean, if I knew what I, if I knew then what I know now, if I don't know if I would have done any better, but I at least would have known that the wind was messing us up and the weather mm -hmm. was messing us up. But back then I just, eh, they aren't biting. But it, it worked out. And then when, when, I guess that was, that was 2015, I think. And then was it the next year you guys went to the Potomac again? Cause I know in 2019 was your big, college potomac finish i remember watching you live but did you get to go to the potomac in between 2015 yes. 2019 yes i went there in 2016 for our second qualifier and i think we ended up having like 16 and a half just shy of 17 and we got like eight okay or maybe we had a little bit less than that but i know we finished eight and i thought that we had a pretty good bag we we caught them well yes that was the that was after the year that we graduated out i remember that yeah yes. was the exact, yeah, yes. was Okay. Yeah. 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 You did really well in that tournament too. And how did you go into the title? And guys, we're building up to this because it really, I think, really tells the whole story of what happened, I think, um, with his big victory. But like being your first time on the Potomac, what was your vibe going into it? Just being like those new eyes that doesn't fish it every day. <sighs> Tough because I started with not a woman and I, I still didn't really understand the tide. You know, like I still hadn't really like put it all together. And I just kind of started in Madeline and got a couple bites, but they weren't really much of anything. So then from there, we went south and we hit Chick, we hit Potomac, we hit Quaya, um, we hit Quantico. We got uh, the, what, what is it, the Quantico headquarters are right there. They're like, you can't yeah. go inside of that. Yeah. Didn't you almost get shot at by a helicopter yeah, or something and, like that? And Jake sent it up into there and the helicopter came and like started circling us. <laughs> We didn't. I mean, we didn't know any better. It just on the map, it just didn't show anything. So we we're like, ah, it maps just messed up. Just yellow. <laughs> and then they come out chasing us, and we were like, oh no, this is not where we should be. <laughs> oh my god. Ah, oh, damn. So then, like, you get in there, you, you crack a good one, and then did you have a better after the tournament? Did you have a better idea of the tide going into to the national, like the big championship, the first yeah. college championship? Yes, because at that one, at the at the re, at the one that uh, that was in the middle of the year in 2016, we pulled into a spot at the very beginning of the day, and there was like 60 other boats on it from another um, tournament that was going on. So we just pull right there in the middle of them, and the tide's not moving. I mean, everybody's mm -hmm. casting, nobody's catching anything. Like I haven't seen anybody catch a thing. So, I mean, at this point, I'm like, man, hopefully hopefully we get something to bite. And I'm, I mean, I knew I could catch fish up in Chick, but I really wanted one down there. I felt like if I could get a bite down there, it might be a decent one. So I put on a four-inch weightless Senko, and I just start chucking that thing around. And all of a sudden, I make a big, long cast out, and I pick up and just toom, toom. I set the hook, and it's instantly in the grass. I mean, whenever we were there, there was grass everywhere. So I'm just reeling in this giant ball of grass and Jake's standing there with the net and we get the grass ball up. You can't even tell if there's a fish in there. And I'm like, man, just go ahead and net it. You know, we'll, we'll see what's under there. It was a five pounder Holy crap. under that pile of grass. And we were the only person to catch one out of all 60 boats. Like I was watching them the entire time. 
you know, so like, I mean, I knew we were the only one that had caught one. We caught that fish and every, you could kind of feel, and here they came. Yes. yes. They were closing in. Uh, they, they smelled the, the first blood and they knew it was time to come in. And I mean, we stayed around for another probably 20 minutes and we were like, yeah, let's get out of here. So we ran up to the chick and there was just one hole in all these scum mats. And it was probably 50 yards by 50 yards. And it had isolated clumps of grass that were about three foot by three foot. We go up in there and they're all sticking straight up and down. And as soon as the time hits, they all just lay right over. And as soon as they laid over, I mean, it, I mean, just like a light switch, mm. it just turns on. And I'm just throwing a little white uh, Kytec on a little belly weighted BMC hook little one eighth ounce three odd i'm flipping that thing right up on all those uh clumps of grass and i can see it you know i mean we're in two or three foot of water and it's super clear with all the grass i'm just reeling that thing by those clumps and i would watch uh two and a half to three pounders come up and just suck it right in and turn and go right back under the clump i mean pretty much every cast you cast you you send it in one when they just come up suck it in and go right back to the clump it was i mean it was just insane it it happened very, very fast. How did you pick up on that? Just, just the idea about the grass. Out. Yeah, just the grass coming over like that. Because that is a very, like, river rat thing to That's know. That's what I mean. We, we fish current. You know, we don't get current very often. Our current on the river isn't generated like Pickwick's current is. Pickwick's current's generated off of heat. Because that's how they power all those cities. So the hotter it is, the more current they're going to pull, the more they run those big dams mm. ours is just off of water how much water is in there how much water can they get rid of how much water are they expecting so whenever you do get current you really have to capitalize on it because it okay. might not last very long like even a even the dam even a barge coming through and them opening up the gates that's enough to like get them to bite but they'll only bite for three minutes and as soon yeah. as that current dies they die like there, there's just nothing to it. So, I mean, it's, that was kind of the tournament that I really started. It kind of clicked for me, you know, cause like at first, I mean, I still like, yeah, all right, you got to fish the tide, mm -hmm. but I had never had it click. And then as soon as I saw that grass lay over and then it worked, like you always hear about, I mean, you always hear people talking like, oh, you go to the Potomac. If you're on the right spot in 20 minutes, it'll happen. You'll catch 20 pounds. And until it happens, yeah, you have no idea mm -hmm. because it really is. I mean, it's a, it's a magical time. As soon as it happens, I mean, it's just they're they're going to eat and they're going to eat it really well when they do. And I think that's what makes every time there was a college tournament, whether we were fishing in it or the year after, we did get a lot of people like talking to us about like, well, how how do you practice? Like, how do you get it dialed in? And the problem is, it's the time for practice. Yeah, when we were getting ready for that Chesapeake tournament. We had we spent three weeks on the water in total and the reason was is you have to go to every single spot and then fish it through all the tide cycles to feel out the area and so that's a shit ton of time versus if you go to a lake and i think that's what makes tidal the hardest is you can't just yolo to a place and know unless you fish it at the right time because if the tide's off you might you're not gonna catch shit and it no. could be the juice and i think that makes practicing there in like two days a day no, it's hard. It's really hard. It's way too hard. And I tell a lot of people that. I tell everybody that asks me about it. I'm like, man, you can go through a spot, never get a bite, and 20 minutes later, there's 25 pounds sitting on it, mm -hmm. ready to eat on that uh, at that time. 20 minutes ago, they were they were there, but they just weren't ready to eat. And then as soon as you pull in and it gets right, they eat. I mean, whenever, even whenever I go into practice, I run Lawrence units. They have tide charts on them. If whatever tide I have for that for the days of the tournament are the tides that I fish for practice. If That's my right. tides don't line up with the tournament, I'm making a run somewhere where they are going to line up, whether it be up the river, whether it be down the river. I don't want to fish times where I'm not fishing for the tournament. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I mean, dude, you're, you're you're talking like just like you should be living here. I mean, it's and and guys, like when I was when I was 
finally was able to get him on and I really looked through some of his stats. The story of this is so cool because it is. You're going from somebody that has never fished high before and you can see him slowly building, uh, especially when we get to the next two tournaments. It just it leads to this is just so cool because you, you figured it out. And and I, I have some thoughts on that too, a hypothesis that we'll get into at the end. But again, everyone, like, please uh, hit the like button. Let's try to get this thing up. I see that at least on YouTube, we have nine and on Facebook, we have another nine. So that's pretty, pretty cool right now. And then again, if you could just leave a comment or a question for Jared, the best question will win a prize tonight. So leave it in the comment section below. Uh, try to keep it semi clean. Semi clean is okay for a Thursday night. Uh, so the next tournament is 2019 on the Potomac. I remember watching you doing your flipping thing. How did that tournament play out? Again, practice leading up to it, going into the tournament. Leading up to it, we were fortunate enough to have the All-American was there two weeks before. It was either a week or two weeks before we were there. And they put our cut off at like four, three or four weeks. So it was during the cutoff, but it didn't mention that tournament. You could still watch that event and see what people were doing. So, I mean, for the three days that it was going on, I mean, I was glued to it. I mean, nothing else mattered. I literally watched that thing like a hawk, and I marked everything that I possibly could that I felt like could work for us. And I could remember them talking about how it had been a really wet year, so the grass hadn't come up as well from the mud. So I instantly kind of knew, like, hard cover was what I need to be focusing on. Like, I need to find something that these bass can relate to. And coming from, I mean, again, coming from here, we run milk runs on the river. You know, I mean, whether it be from barges or whether it just be just a milk run. I mean, you can run a barge. If a barge is going up or going down, the current from the river banks will push when that barge is going by. So you can get on a bite to where you can run and stay right in front of that barge and as that current turns on, you can catch fish if you stay in front of him the whole time. Dude, that is so freaking cool. Running with him. So, and then okay. even if there's not a barge, I mean, you can still, I mean, you just run and gun, run and gun the whole the whole time. So going into it, I was like, man, I got to fish hardcover. You know, like, I, I we got to get this figured out. So we started our first day in Chick. Um, it was actually right next to where Tristan McCormick got second at, at that event. We pull in there. We had like two and a half hours was all we had of that one day once practice opened. They only gave us like that evening, like two, maybe two and a half hours. Pull in there. I catch a four pounder like right off the rip, off of the spot. And we're kind of talking about it, talking about it. When day ends, we go out the next morning. We just start running hardcover. And we're running the tide going up. So as that low tide was at the bottom, as it would start at Mata Woman, it hadn't mm -hmm. started up at uh, Pohit Creek. You know, it still it takes it a good 15, 20 minutes before the current actually starts rolling up there. Mm -hmm. So I knew we could fish stuff at Mata Woman and not miss the bite up there. That'd give us, you know, 20, 30 minutes to fish it. Then we could run straight up. We could hit up there. And then up at Swan Creek, it wasn't moving for another 20 or 30 minutes. We could fish it hard there, get everything we could, and then we could bounce up and go farther. And I think that we hit it at the perfect time to where those fish were coming out of their spawning coves. And I think they were starting to try to work their way out to the main river channel. They were going to start trying to find the grass whenever it did come and just start feeding up. And, man, we we really, really figured it out at that one. Like, I mean, we we had it down to the point where, I mean, we hooked probably our first three or four fish doing it and they were all like three four pounders sure. and we, were like, we were like dude we just we're going for bites and that our last day of practice or the day that we really ran that pattern i'd say we probably had 50 or 60 bites and the funny thing was that day that we had all those bites there was a north wind all night that held all that water out it kept sucking it out and it made it lower mm. than what it should have been so whenever it came in, it came in even harder than what it should have came in. You know, like, I mean, even more water was pouring in, trying to get it back to that normal level of sea level. So it really, really made them bite. So then on day two of the tournament, we had that exact same thing, which is where we slipped up. Had that weather not been there, I'm not saying that we would have won. 
All I know is we had 17 on the first day, 17 on the last day. We had 14 in the next. You know, so, I mean, I really feel like we, we could have done really well had the weather have cooperated for the tide, had it not been a wind tide. So, going into the tournament, man, we, I mean, like, like I said, we just knew. We just mm-hmm. had this idea that they were really, really going to bite for us. And we would just hang out there close, right there around Mad Woman. That's right about where our, uh, our milk run would start. And we'd go all the way to the D.C. Bridge. And we had probably six different spots that we would run all the way up through there. Yeah. So for you guys that, that for some reason that live here, don't know the Potomac, which is probably only one of you. So yeah, Matter Woman and then up north is towards DC when we're talking about that. And so the right side based on the map is the Maryland side. The, the, the left side is the Virginia side. So you can see that you have Belmont Bay. That's basically straight across from Matter Woman. And then you can go straight up to Pohick, which is Fort Washington, all the way up to the DC bridge. Which I mean, that's again the thing about the tournament. That's a hell of a run for you to be doing. And how the hell did you have? I guess the I want to say the balls to do that because, like, I, I don't know. Like tournament runs. The thing about milk runs that, that really get me nervous is I'm not fishing, um, right. and it's a timing deal. And I get it. Like it's so cool for for title guys. Like when you hit the milk run right, you look so cool. But then it can completely screw you up if you mess up the timing. So. Like, how did you keep, did you have a stop watching the boat? Like, what did you do to make sure, like, you were like, okay, we're not going to waste too much time with this? Honestly, man, just, we, we I utilize my Lowrance units in that tide to a T. And I think Lowrance does it the best. I, I have no affiliation with Lowrance. Mm-hmm. I just really, really, I think they're the best graphs out there, easiest to use, everything like that. And their tide charts, they pull up off of the closest pin that's to you. So, I mean, we had all the pins marked. We knew which ones were which. And at the end of the day, you know, you can hop on the tide chart and you can look at, okay, I, I want to look at Mad Woman and mm-hmm. I want to see what their tide chart is. And then I want to go up to Broad Creek and I want to see what it is up there. And you could see that there was like an hour difference between the two of when it started to rise or when it started to fall, either or. And you just kind of, I mean... <sighs> It's definitely a ballsy move to do. It is. But mm-hmm. whenever they're biting, like we figured out they bit as soon as, like, I mean, it was, you had to be there within the first 30 minutes of that tide moving. And they were just chewing. I mean, they flat out would eat. I mean, as soon as you'd flip in there, your jig would be 10 feet to the left or 10 foot to the right, chewing on it. I mean, we were shaking fish as hard as we could to get them off in practice. Yeah. I, I mean, and then Shane, you know, really good question there. It, so the milk run is something that is very, it's, I think it's current dependent. I mean, we'll say it's usually tied, but as Jared was saying with the barges and stuff, I think milk runs in my hypothesis are really good for hardcover versus grass. Cause to me, it's like, if you find a grass patch that has 20 pounds in it, you just, you sit and you catch them. But I feel like the tournaments that generally are won with a milk run, there's a lot of hardcover involved in it to do it. I could be wrong, but that's just my vibe here w- with that. Um, but to me, yeah, it, it's just like, what, what, again, you hit it in the hell. Like you got to know not only the timing factor, but when within that window you need to get your bites and then you're on the juice. And then did you and your partner, when you're doing that, because this is really the next one we're going to get into is just you. Did you guys fish two different baits? Were you taking two different sides of the water column? Or are you guys doing the same thing? We pretty much did the same thing. Um, every day, the, it kind of seemed like they would change up. The jig, I don't think changed. Now, I think on day two, we maybe could have switched something up and maybe picked up better fish. It's easy to say that now, whenever then, you know, I mean, we were catching great fish on a jig. So it was pretty tough to put it down, you know, but both of us had two rods out. Both of us had a jig on each rod and both of us had different colors and we just rotated colors. And every day you could tell there was one color that worked better than another, whether it was a black and blue or a blue crawl, or a, a whatever, the orange and green pumpkin, like a Bama crawl, green pumpkin flat. I mean, it really just depended every day which one they wanted. But they mm-hmm. seemed like they wanted it the whole time. That was, to me, is like how that, that bite held up as well as it did um, with the same bait, without having you to make any adjustments. Like, did you guys have any pressure with that? Or is there any other boats running your your stuff, or did you have it completely to yourself? We never had anybody on anything that we fished the entire time. Nobody really, nobody really got near us. Nobody really 
there might have been a couple of guys on one stretch of dogs, but I th- I I I don't want to speak for everybody else, but I know for me, tide is definitely not an easy thing to kind of catch on to. I think once you get it, it becomes a little bit easier to you to kind of understand and know what you're doing. But I think a lot of guys struggle with it on. I got a bite here, but I got it at this time. I got it at 10.30. So tomorrow at 10.30, I need to be here. Well, tide drops with the moon, and every mm-hmm. day it steps back 45 minutes to an hour. So, yeah, you might have caught that fish at 10.30 today, but tomorrow it might be 11.30. And if you're there at 10.30, you fish it for an hour, you don't get bit, you make a run, they start eating. And I think guys kind of it, – it's a tough thing to understand. But once you get it, you get it. Did you have certain places that you relied on? And I'm going to say that here. And then uh, I found this little gem that I had to show you. So Uh, I found this little gem that I had to show you. So. What happened here? And I want to play it one more time for the people that are that, that are just seeing this. Two young men from there kept coming up with big fish time after time when they needed it most. That's a good one. That's a big one. That's a monster. That's a monster. This is a monster. This is it right here, baby. Yeah. Let's go! Let's go, son! That's what I'm talking about! Right there, baby! Go, y'all, baby! Let's go! Give me some of this, son! Yeah! Let's go! So I, every Potomac person knows that dock and exactly where you're at, but like, what was that like a place that you have run before a couple of times? I want to, I want to get into what's in your head here, but like, did you go there specifically for that one big bite or was this a new stretch of docks that you were actually fishing? Man, that was a spot that we found in practice. And we, I mean, we got really good bites down it. and little did we know uh, the guys who were leading it after day one, who was Nolan Miner and his partner, they were fishing the same dock. But, or the same stretch of dogs, but they were fishing it on a falling tide first thing off the rip. And Nolan caught a six pounder off of it on day one off of that same area. And little did we know we were all fishing the same area, right? So we mm-hmm. talked, I don't, I don't believe he made the final day or if he did, he barely did. But we talked about that with them at the end of the tournament about how we were fishing up there. And they're like, hey, we were fishing right there. Like, we caught our six pounder right there. We caught God. ours right there. So they, I mean, they were in there, man, and we just ran. I mean, we just had certain ones, you know. And there's not a ton of docks out there, you know. So I mean, it's not not yeah. hard to kind of figure them out. It's probably harder to figure out the timing than it is anything. Yeah. No. But I mean, they, some of them, like we had one stretch, and I forget which creek it is. It's the one right above Pohig. There's a big stretch of docks that go all the way down through there, and there's a marina. Everybody mm-hmm. knows which one it is. And that stretch the first two days was phenomenal for us. The final day we went down through there and we never got a single bite the entire, I mean, we spent like an hour and an hour to probably an hour and 15 minutes on it just because we felt that confident that we could get bit there. And we knew if we could, it would probably be a good one. Cause I caught like a five pounder off of it on day one. And we were catching good, good quality fish off of it. We just never got a bite. What was going through your head? And I, I saw your face when we played that clip. What what was going through your head when you when you let her rip on that hook set? Did it you- doesn't it doesn't show it in the video, and it's actually pretty funny. But the cast right before that, I flip under that dock, and you can see me like in the very beginning of the video. I'm smiling and looking at my camera guy because whenever I flip in, I set the hook and I hook into a catfish. He instantly rolls, and as soon as he does, my jig flies out. And it hits my camera guy like right in the side of the head, and my line gets all jammed up in him. So like right before that, like I'm up in there like untangling him, like pulling all my stuff out of him. And what as soon as I get it up, I literally like that's whenever I turn back and smile at him and I make a flip in the exact same spot. And I don't know if it was the catfish kicking up the mud and firing that fish up and making her really want to eat and like showing her like something's there. But mm-hmm. it was as soon as my bait hit the water, I picked it up one time and it was just, ah. and it was as hard as it could be. And I leaned into it. I mean, you can, you fish out there enough, you flip enough dogs, you know, when you hook into yeah. a roller and when you hook into a 
daggone big. Uh, yeah, especially with the Potomac and the amount of catfish. Like it, it is, oh. yeah, a hundred percent. Like yeah, the amount of catfish. So catfish. There's yeah. so many of them. It's it's absolutely stupid. Um, I, I mean, and and then you you guys finished. Ext- I I think you guys did extremely well. I mean, you finished third. I think honestly. Title is the hardest place to win on. It's the easiest place to cash a check on. Like you, 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 once you figure it out, you you can you can get good points out of an event, but it's a gamble to say like, oh, I'm going to win it. It's so hard because it is. There's so much timing there, and, and you guys did so damn well. And this is the part though that really blows me away is because now you have history, and this gets to the big. I think the crescendo of this whole thing, which is uh, your 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 amazing win last year, because you now have history at this place. And so going into that event. Um, and you could probably help with my memory here, but it was a it was a late it was an early in October event, I believe. It was early October or the mid October? Yeah, October 14, 15, 16, I believe. Yeah. Okay. And then you knew this tournament was going to go in there. Did you practice? Did you get any pre practice in? What was your vibes going into it? No. Um, I mean, you you had to qualify through the BFLs. You had to be forty fifth place by the end of the season. So going into the last event of the regular season, which was our super which was up on Lake Erie, I was sitting in 64th place. I was not close. I had to be top 45. And luckily, our super is double points. So I roll into there. I'm at Lake Erie. I took a few days off to go up there and pre-fish. It got super rough. I figured them out inside uh, in the bay in some lily pads. And I was fortunate enough to place, I think, 17th. I was 10th after day one. I dropped a little bit on day two to finish up 17th. So that put me in 41st place to go. And all I told myself the entire year was, you just got to make it to the Potomac. I I just, I just love going there. There's just something, I don't know what it is about. It's not, not even because I've won there or anything like that. I just truly love going there. It is Mm -hmm. one of the most special places to fish. And anybody that hasn't fished there really needs to, because it is well worth your time to go over there and figure it out. Because they just flat out eat over there when it's time to eat. So I was like, man, I just got to make it. And I travel with two other dudes, two of my best friends in the entire world. And us three and another kid that we went to school with up at Adrian, he made it through the Michigan division and they were fishing with us. So us four rolled down there and we were like, man, we're going to, we got to figure them out. And practice was pretty rough to say the least. Practice was rough every day. I think we had three full days that we practiced out there. I had one. Decent lily pad patch. I knew I could catch fish in. Whether I don't think I could have caught even 15 pounds. I don't even think I could have caught 14 pounds. I think it was a 12 and a half to 13 pound spot is about what I was pulling out of. Two and a half pounders was about the max. A couple, two and three quarters here and there. And then the very last day, I roll up into this cove. And one of the dudes that I travel with is fishing up in there. And... He runs to the back. I run to the other side. I get a couple of bites. He gets a couple of bites. And he runs over to this spot in the back of Pohick, and there's just a ton of scum. And he's like, man, he's like, there's a ton of scum over here. You ought to come and fish the other side. It was like, it was like 400, 500 yard stretch. You know, nobody else is in it. It's just me and him. And you can see frog lines through it. But, you know, it was what it was. There's frog lines everywhere out there through the scum. You go to any creek, that's how it is. We roll in and I make like six casts and I have two or three, four pounders come up and just suck it in right by the boat. And then I'm not fishing the tide. I'm not fishing any of that stuff. I'm literally just casting a frog. And I got three big ones that come up and I can physically see them coming up and just wow, just sucking it in. So going into it, he was like, man, he said, I'm going to fish the other side. I think I have better fish over there. And I was like, well, I'm going to come over here to this side and I'm going to fish over here. I don't know how many people there's going to be or nothing. And from there is where it kind of started to make sense, more or less. How did you decide? Because Pohick has been a place that now you've had a lot of experience in doing the milk run. You visit there a lot and you ignore going to 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 acquire the beach, Belmont. Uh, Potomac Creek, Nanjimoy in, in history past. And these are places, if you talk to locals, they talk to you about, okay, this is places that you're going to usually win at, blah, blah, blah. You ignore all that. And you went to Belmont. And this is a little bit of history, but this history worked out. Could you talk about that a little bit? Like, why did you, I guess, go against the grain a little bit there? Um, I find that I work better out of the crowd. I find that, and a lot of fishermen 
have this. Um, and I will say this is probably one of my not so strong suits of title where it was up until this event was being able to be around other people and see other people catching fish and mm -hmm. knowing that my time was coming. It just wasn't there yet. You know, it's really hard to sit there and watch somebody else sack them up when your fish haven't made it to you yet or whatever it might be, or they haven't fired yet. And you're just sitting there watching and watching and watching. So I, I like to avoid the crowd. I like to stay away from those guys. Um, you know, there's always that chance that you run down there and you go to lay down your spot and there's a guy power pulled right down where you want to be and he's not moving the entire day. He's waiting for him to fire. Then what do you do? You know, you, you have to scrap and try to find something else, but it's hard to find stuff there in the tournament based on the tide. Yeah, no. You know what I'm saying? It's not, I mean, you really got to pick an area apart to figure it out and figure out the needle in the haystack. Yeah, especially if it's hardcover related, I think. I mean, I get like there are guys that have spent years and they know every little hard spot and that or hardcover, which is fine. But like, I think hardcover only holds so many, especially on the reverse versus grass. So yeah, if they're power pulled down on that one stump in there, like, yeah, you're screwed. Like you can't really yeah. fish around them. Um, and, and I think it sounds like really from what we talked about, it was more of a grass deal as well. But you did go back to Belmont Bay. You did go back to this area and you had it to yourself, but then you did figure more out. And this is a multi-day tournament. So uh, honestly, take us through like day one and, and, and you starting this thing off. Um, it was Pohick that we were up in back there, straight across from whatever that ramp is that's in the back of Pohick. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sylvain. No, I don't think it's that one. But no, it's not it's not Lisylvania, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Lisylvania, there's one ramp over there. So day one, I roll into that creek and I'm planning as you go back, I'm planning on fishing the left. And I look into the left and there's seven boats sitting on it. I'm like, ah, there's no room for me in there. So I keep going. I look to the right and I can see all that grass and there's a bunch of boats. And then at the very end, there's nobody. I'm like, you know what? It's the first spot of the day. I'm gonna pull in there and I'm gonna fish it. So I start there, I fish down, my co-angler puts like four in the box. I don't have any yet. I'm still just fishing, fishing, fishing. I finally get a limit. And then towards like the very end of the day, right as that tide, I believe the tide was dropping at that point. I, it kind of gets quiet, kind of not getting any bites. And all of a sudden I hit this one little grass patch right out in front of a, a duck blind. Mm. I make probably eight casts and I catch five fish that all that called out all of my fish that I had before. They like call out everything. It puts me at like 14 7, I think is what I ended up with. But every fish I started started that morning with that I caught, they were all called out. I mean, it was I mean, I caught probably three or four in a row, just one cast after another, same exact spot. They were just eating it. So going from there, I'm in seventh place going into the final day. Top six make the All-American. So that that day, on day one, I look at my tide when they start biting, and it's at a 1.7. High tide was 2.2 to 2.3, and low tide was a 0.23, I believe is what it was, right around there, maybe mm -hmm. plus or minus a couple hundreds. So that morning, we're putting in, and I get a kid from uh, Michigan, actually. He's a couple years younger than me. Uh, Evan Eldred and huge shout out. What's that? It's a huge shout out, bud. Yeah, huge shout out to Evan. Uh, I get him and he's like, Man, well, how's it gonna go today? And I, I checked the tide and I said, We're gonna, we're gonna catch them as soon as we get there. I said, We are going to hit it as it's, as it's getting right. We pull into that spot. We had a late boat draw on day one, which is why everybody beat us. We had an early boat draw on day two. We roll in there. We're the first boat on the spot. I run up. I grab a black frog off my deck, make my first cast of my first grass clump, twitch it twice, and four pounder eats it. Mm -hmm. and very first cast of the day, as soon as we get in there. He's not even picked up a rod yet. Get the net. Put a four pounder in the box. From there, I would say it was probably 30 to 40 minutes, and I had just shy of 21 pounds. Oh, good God, dude. Damn. It, was, it was the most... Unbelievable. It was one of those times where, where I was talking about earlier it was when it happens, 
you'll understand it. It's if surreal. Understand what's, it's just unbelievable, man. And I stayed in a 50 yard section the entire day. And I, man, there was this one grass clump and I, I kind of started to see this as the tournament progressed. I didn't really know it a hundred percent yet, but I kind of started to realize it. Well, as that tide hit a point or a 1.7, I don't know what the reasoning was, but there were these big black crawdads. They were black and red, hmm. these giant scum mats. These crawdads, as that water would start moving, they would crawl their way up through the scum and sit on the top. And you could see them, man. I mean, they were big. They're four inch crawdads, absolute studs. Wow. And I was taking that black frog and I was just popping it through that scum. And when it was on, they absolutely ate it. And they would just engulf it. I caught one just over five in that 30 minute window. And everything else was right at four. If not, one was just a hair under. One was like a 380. I think it was my small fish. Guys, and a huge thing to catch on to with what he's saying, and this reminds me so much of my brother and I got to actually go, and we actually followed Aaron Martin around in his tournament. And he had one of his graphs when he won the Chesapeake was always on a tide chart. He literally had it up the whole time. And every time you're talking, everything is positioned around when the tide hit this level which you were so locked onto that tide and the fluctuation. I think that is so critical to just have that in your head. When it hits this level, this is where I have to be. And that's all that matters out there. You know, like it, it, that, that's literally all that matters. I mean, it, sun, clouds, all that stuff kind of makes a difference. It's tide. You know, I mean, and that's, that's, I think mm -hmm. the reason I like it so much is just because they're always going to bite. You know, you got to figure out what they want. You got to figure out what they want to do and how they want it. But at some point, they're always going to bite. There's never, there's not really a tournament where it's like, eh, you know, guys aren't really catching. Like, you're going to, somebody's going to find them. And somebody's going to find them in a big way every time you're there. And man, as soon as I caught that limit, it was kind of a silly mistake. Uh, I pretty much put the frog down, you know, but I was, I was under the assumption that. Tomorrow, I, I, you know, I, I didn't know I was going to be leading, but I was under the assumption where I have to sit on this spot all day because I don't want somebody else coming in here to catch them. And I had the boat pointed towards that spot and a little bit into it, some guys started to come around. I thought, you know what, I'm going to spin around. I spun around and I shot Evan, who was my co-angler for the day. I pointed him towards the spot. I said, cast there for the rest of the day. So that's the only spot you need to cast to, one after another. And for the next six to seven hours, he casted in that spot every single cast. And he ended up with, I think, just over 15 pounds, which Damn. jumped him from 29th all the way up to second place through the event. So I had just over 20. He had just over 15. I'm sitting in first. He's sitting in second going into the final day. Dude, good on you. That's awesome. That's it was cool, awesome. man. It was cool. It was it was fun to watch him. Um, he's more of a smallmouth guy. Mm -hmm. Being up in Michigan, why would you go for green fish when you can catch twenty five pounds of smallmouth all the time? Like I I fully understand it, but he didn't really know much about a frog, and I bet he missed thirty bites that day. I mean, he missed one after another. Just couldn't couldn't get the hook set down. You know, I'm like count a couple times. You know, wait, wait, wait. Finally, yeah. he starts to get it. And if we had like probably 30 minutes left in our day, and I was like, man, you got, you got to have, you got to get one more, but you're four fish. Like you can't, we can't go in. You got to catch your lemon. And he finally catches his lemon fish, like a three pounder jumps him up. So then I forget how many they sent on to the next day. I don't know if it was 15 or if it was 20, they went on to the final day, but whatever it was, nine of us were in that bed. Nine of us out of the top mm. 12, I would say, were in there fishing together. So now so, you have to deal with crowds, too, which is something Oh, else. yeah. So I'm dealing yeah. with the crowd the entire tournament. The first day, there was like eight boats. The second mm. day, there was probably 30 boats. Once mm. word got out of where everybody was catching them, Perfect, yeah. they, they were coming. And there was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And this is the part of the Potomac too, is like sometimes I think this is the thing that I struggle with is sometimes when do you, when do you leave the crowd? And then sometimes is it a mistake to leave the crowd? Cause sometimes it is like, they're just, they're all there. All the fish are there. Right. And that was what, for the first two days I, I left one time on the first day, just because it kind of died for me after I caught my limit. 
I ran up to that one creek that I had some uh, those uh, lily pads on, and there was another guy sitting on there, and he was catching them. I don't know how big they were, but all I know is I saw him catch quite a few fish off of it. So I spun around and went back. Day two, I never left. On day two, all those boats come in there, right? Everybody starts flocking in. They know where the bite's at, where everybody wants a piece of the pie. Mm-hmm. Well, everybody starts going into this grass mount. As they're going in, they're breaking it up the whole entire time. Well, then on day three, the wind switches and the wind's blowing into that bay. Mm. So I go out boat number one. I'm the first one to the spot. I come off pad right where the grass is. And I look at my map and the grass map that I'm fishing is 30 yards behind me and it's gone. It's no, it's nowhere to be found. And there's literally just a, small like 20 to 30 yard section of it off the bank all the way around and it's nothing what it was before so as all these boats are coming i mean everybody just comes off pad right in their spot and we're just lined up nine Mm -hmm. boats 10 boats 12 boats right down through the line and everybody's bombing them out in there so i catch a keeper and then the guy who's in second and evan who are together who were both in second because they send you out at whoever has the, whoever's <laughs> in the same place, pro and co. Okay. Or boat or co angler. So there to my right, there's another dude to my left, and they start firing off for Evan. And Evan starts catching them. He catches a five pounder in front of everybody. He catches like a, he had like 15, 15 and a half pounds again on day three. Good for and him. He blew it out of the water. Dude, he figured he out that frog bite or something. My God. He got it down, man. He could. <laughs> he said there was this one mat that he could see out there that was still a mat. The rest of it was just grass, just clumped up across the top. So there was one mat he could still see, and he was like, I could barely cast to the farthest side of it. He said, that's all I needed. If I could get it to that mat, he said, I could normally get bit. And he just whacked him down through there. And I had one fish, and he's catching them, and then his boater starts catching them. And probably... 10 o'clock, I pull the plug. You know, there there starts to get bites. I'm in the grass. I'm stuck in the grass where I'm at. Was there starting to get bites? Everybody else is pulling out of the grass and going to where they're at. And they start, everybody just starts surrounding them. At that point, I look and I go, there's no room for me there. You know, I can't fit in there. I'm not going to go in there and crowd everybody else. So I send it back out run to the opposite side of the Potomac or run the opposite side of Pohick, pull in there. I catch a three pounder off of uh, this grass, little grass clump that I had over there that I'd gotten bit in. And I don't know if it was good karma from taking Evan on day two or what it was. I, I still have no idea to this day, but my co-angler, he told me, he said, Hey man, yesterday we went to the back of Matt, a woman. He said, me and my boater, he said, my boater didn't do that well. He said, but I had a ton of frog bites and it's, we were fishing just like what you're saying. You were fishing on the other side. And he said, I know the wind's not going to hurt it in there. And at this point, I'm like, man, I got two fish in the boat. I am going to lose this event if I don't figure something out. And I know it's not going to happen in here. And I was like, all right, man, tell me where to go. So we run to the very back of Matta Woman. We go through the pilings. We get into the no wake, go all the way back in there. He's like, that's the mat right there. There's two different mats. There was one right here, and there was one another 200 yards down. Pull in there, I make five casts on that mat. I catch a four-pounder. Mm. Put him in the boat, fish that mat some more, bounce on down to the next mat, make a cast out. I catch a three and a quarter, and then he catches one. So at this point, I got four, and my time ended. That was it. The tide started coming in. We had to get out. I mean, we had to idle pretty good just to get four – to get against that tide once it starts running into Matta Woman, it's pretty rough. Yeah. It, it runs like a river. I mean, that sucker absolutely pulls some current. So we got out of there, man. And I'll be honest with you, I pulled into the ramp and I knew I had lost that. I knew I had lost. Like, there was no question in my mind. I was like, man, I couldn't even pull out a limit today. You know, I dropped 20 pounds yesterday and I could not pull, figure this thing out and make it happen today. And I started talking around and everybody's having a bad day. And the dude who's in second, he's like, man, I only got four. He's like, I couldn't catch five. He said, your buddy in the back, he said, he's whacking them. He said, he's got giants. (laughs) I couldn't couldn't buy a bite. That's, 
when did you know? And what were the butterflies like in your gut? Like that? I knew when I weighed in. I literally did not know until I walked up there and weighed in on stage. Whenever he said you need whatever it was that I needed, I knew that I had like 12 and a half pounds. And I was like, mm-hmm. right around 12.7, 12.5, 12.7, somewhere in there. And I think I was about 12.7 is when I weighed in on that final day. He said I needed like high 11s. And I was like, I think I got that. And it was wild. I, mean, I, I, I don't, yeah. I don't really know if it really set in just because I don't feel like I finished it the way that I wanted to. It's weird. Yeah. It's a weird it's feeling. You don't feel like you weird feelings where like I felt the whole day that I had lost the event, even pulling into the tournament. I never felt like I truly closed the door. You know, yeah. after day yeah. two, I felt, I was like, man, I've really put myself in this. Like I've, I really did well today. And then I only bring in four fish on the final day. And there was just something weird about it to where I was like, man, I don't, yeah. I just don't feel like I sealed it. But you also did what good quarterbacks sort of do, and you did a two-minute drill. Like you, you finally read the situation early enough to make the change, and that's I think that creates good execution because you did, like you said, like oh shit, I got I got to do something different. And that's the thing, like I, I wouldn't have caught him in there. I mean, guys did catch him, like guys brought in some fish, but everybody told me they were like 13, 14 inches were all that were there, and for some reason I just had this feeling that if I stay in there. I'm going to have to watch these guys beat me today. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I'll go somewhere else where I don't have to watch myself get beat. I'll go, I'll, I'll go lose in peace, you know, where I, where I'm trying to get my own bites and figure my own thing out. I'm not going to sit here and watch you guys beat me. Mm-hmm. So that's more or less kind of what it came down to is I got to make it, I got to make a move and my moves not here. That had to have been a hell of a drive home though, just to be thinking about all that stuff. I, I, I sat in the really vehicle for like an hour and a half, two hours, and I couldn't even talk. You know, I mean, I had calls, I had texts, I had everything, mm-hmm. and I was just speechless. I mean, I had just nothing. You know, because I've watched, I watched Cole Floyd win this probably four or five years ago. He won the regional, and I can specifically remember looking into it, and he won like sixty grand, sixty or seventy grand, and I remember thinking to myself like that's incredible. You know, somebody at, at his age, my age, your age, being able to go out there and beat all these guys. Like I was like, there, you know, how many, how many guys that age actually get to win that much money? And that's, that's, I, I've always thought about that ever since he won that one. I was like, man, that'd be so cool to win one. And the fact that I just love this buildup though, like, like you flirted with this on the Potomac. I mean, like the national championship, all your tournaments, like you were right there. You started to figure this river out and you were so close to that national championship. And this is like just the redemption arc, honestly, of you doing this now. Yep. Um, it was the icing on the cake to say the least. Yeah, a- absolutely. And then, you know, and I don't want to, Guys, I know we're running uh, like over plus an hour here, but yeah, like, like and comment. If you have a question uh, for, for Jared, please uh, drop a question real quick. We'll try to get them answered before we uh, we finish up here. And that, you know, that kind of leads us up to this last Potomac tournament that happened like oh, is it two weeks ago now, the Toyota series that you hopped in. And then are, are you fishing a specific Toyota series? Like what are your fishing plans before we finish up with this this newest Potomac tournament? Um, I'm fishing the Buckeye BFLs again. Uh I love the circuit. I got a lot of buddies that fish in it, man. I mean, we have an absolute blast. There's like 10 to 12 of us that travel together. We stay together. We camp together. We do pretty much everything that we can together. So, I mean, it's just, it's, I truly enjoy it and everybody else does. I mean, we all love doing them. And I've kind of went out on my own and I've decided to fish. I was just going to fish the first one and I've decided I'm going to go ahead and go fish the second one. But coming into or that Potomac tournament, man, I, I was, I was really on them, like going into it. Like, I'm not saying that I was on like a winning bag, but I was on, I was on the fish that I needed to make a top 10 run with that thing. I don't think that I was on 20 pounds per se. I don't know if I could have done that. I think that 17 was about 17 to 18 was about right where I was at, but I was sitting in 39th after day one. Uh, I stayed north again. I did my same normal thing that I do. I tried to stay away from the crowd. I tried to run different stuff. And I just ran natural bank the entire time. And I just threw a frog. I threw a frog and I threw a jig. Because I know that, I mean, a frog is the thing that I usually get my biggest bites on. 
and that's all I was really wanting. You know, I mean, I everybody wants to go out and catch fish, but I want to catch. I want to go catch some biggins. Like that's a big tournament, and those guys are going to catch them. And that's mm-hmm. the crazy thing about fishing with them boys. I mean, there's a lot of dudes in there that are just going to flat out catch them. How big was the field? Two hundred bows. Dear God. Okay, on the yeah, that's insane for the river. 200, 200 pros, two hundred co anglers. Um, I was in thirty ninth after day one. I we had a front come through the night before the event. It rained like almost an inch, like just shy of an inch. And man, they seemed to bite that next day on the frog. And I caught I had fourteen fourteen is what I weighed in. And I had a I had a little bit of a milk run down to where on a falling tide. I would fish a frog and I would fish lay downs and flip, flip lay downs and stuff like that on a shallow tide, on a low tide. I was fishing, uh, like some little grass flat that the grass didn't top out all the way. So I could throw a top water across it. And there was just a lot of fish there. I, I was hoping that there was big ones mixed in. Cause I mean, there was a lot, mm-hmm. I mean, there's loads of two to two and a half pounders in this spot. Everybody knew it. I mean, there was, 20 30 boats and i pulled in there all just going up and down the bank everybody was catching them i went in i caught them on day one didn't help really and then on the rising tide i got on a dock bite again and i got on a really 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 good dock bite of getting really good quality bites and on day one i don't know if it was the um I think it was a little bit of wind. I think we got a little bit of wind tide that kind of held it up a little bit because it didn't seem to be running like I had seen it before. And we had overcast. So I don't know if they really mm-hmm. needed the shade as much as what the, I thought that they were going to need it. You know, but you don't have enough current. You don't have any sun. That's a recipe for the bass not being where you want them to be on tidal mm-hmm. water. That's a recipe for them to throw an audible and not do what you want. So day two comes, I catch like 30 keepers probably on day one. It's just getting better bites. You know, so day two comes, the front's over, it's not overcast anymore. And you can, you can definitely tell by the fishing because they did not, they were very stingy that day. So I fished my first spot that I caught my limit down. I had like 12 pounds by 830 the first day. The second day I had, didn't have a fish till probably 10 o'clock. I finally got one to bite. Then I I ran the first day. I didn't have enough of a falling tide to be able to run all of my spots. So I had to limit myself to right where I felt like I could get the best bites. Mm-hmm. That was the only spot I had to fish. So on day two, I did have a falling tide all day. Not all day, all morning till about 11 noon. So I just started running that up every creek. I'd pull into a creek and if there was... There might not be a lot of fish there, but I pulled into one creek. I caught one. I caught a four pounder. The only fish I got down that bank, but it was a four. I go up to the next creek, and this was the fish that, that costed it for me. Uh, I'm fishing lay downs. I found one lay down that I know has good fish on it. I know it's going to hold good fish because in practice, I caught a good one there. So I, all the other lay downs seemed a little bit too shallow, and this one seemed like it had everything that it needed to. Had a little bit of depth at the end. It had a good like little brush pile under the water for a bass to get in. I mean, everything set up right for it. I cast my frog up under it, right off the end of it. I'm working it out, working it out, and I'll one mm. and sucks it in. I mm. lean into it. My rod bows over good. And about the time it bows over good, the fish turns and comes right at me. So I'm like standing up, you know, and I'm reeling, reeling, reeling. Got, still got some bend in my pole tip. I can't really tell how big he is because the rain stained the water. So I can't really see into the water to see like the quality of fish that he is. So I'm reeling, 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 get it right to the boat, two hand grab, go to lift. And she was way bigger than I thought she was. She was over four, probably four and a half, maybe just shy of five. Mm. And she smacks the side of the boat. Uh, whenever she hits, she throws slack in the line, pops my frog out and she goes back in. Mm. So I tell my co, I'm like, man, I'm not, I'm not fishing tomorrow just cause of that fish. Like I, I could tell that the bite was off enough to where if you could get a four pound bite, you really had to make it count. And I already had one and then I got number two and I just never could seal the deal. So 
ran back to my starting spot and I caught a two and a half. I caught a three and then I caught a 163. And I had that 163 the entire day. And uh, we ended up placing 33rd. And I was seven ounces out of making the top 25 cut to fish the final day. I had one, would have gave me like a th- probably two and a two and three quarter, three pounds is about what it would have gave me. So that would have put me in like 12th or 13th going into the final day. Probably so Monday morning quarterback here. What would you have just camped and fished a grass bed? Because I know like that ended up doing real well for some people. Or would you have continued with the milk run and just Oh, I wouldn't have changed I wouldn't have changed anything that I did. I I the final day I think I might have caught. I don't know if I'd have caught Mm twenty, but every day that I fished it, I real I figured out more and more. Like more and more kind of clicked. Like the grass, like after like going into the second day, I'm like, I'm not fishing that grass spot anymore. There's no quality fish there. So I'm not going to waste my resources going there just to catch a bunch of fish that aren't going to help me. Mm-hmm. And even whenever the low tide hit, I still only had two fish. You know, I, I probably could have ran down there and caught a couple two pounders, mm-hmm. but I knew that I needed more than two pounders to win. it. I mean, I only had two fish and, or I had two fish all the way till noon. Yeah. You know, and I, I still, I mean, we were at a low tide. I mean, the tide was barely coming up right at the end of the day. Like, there wasn't really a guarantee that I was going to get them to eat. But I knew that if I was going to do decent, it wasn't going to be down there. Mm-hmm. And yeah. there was just loads of bait, dude. It was, it was unbelievable. The amount of shad, or not shad, but fry. And all those coves were literally just littered all the way across. And you could see shad, or not shad, but fry. And if you found a lay down that had fry close to it, that was actually holding to it, not the fry out there doing its own thing, but the fry that were holding to something, you could get a bit off. You could get bit off every single one of them. No question asked. That's crazy. I could, I could guarantee a fish off of every one, even on the tough day. They didn't hold that well to it. But if I could find one that had, had fry holding to it, I could catch a fish off of it. So out of all the tournaments that you fished on the Potomac, and then I, we won't even count the one Chesapeake tournament, but it sounds like you you keep leaning towards hardcover versus grass. Is that is that something now looking at it, like your body of work there, like you see vividly, like shit, all these tournaments, I somehow always lean towards the hardcover. Is that, I don't know, is that something you ever realized? Is that because you're getting the bigger bite at hardcover or are you more just comfortable picking apart the hard stuff? I'd say it's more than I'm comfortable. And I would also say that, it depends on the timing that I'm there, you know, because I'm not, like I said, I'm not going, I'm more than likely not going to go to a quiet. I'm more than likely not going to go to Quantico. I'm more than likely not going to go to Potomac. That's where this time of year or a month behind where we are now, that's where the grass is going to be. And where I normally go, there's just normally not grass until you get into those later months. Once the summer's hit, once it really gets the growth that it needs. And I'm not sure if that's from rain coming through and mur- mur- like making that water murkier than what it normally is to where the, the light can't penetrate to get the grass going as well or what it is. But I don't know. I, I, I like the hardcover when there's no grass because that's what they'll be on. Yeah. Like, and it's so funny you mentioned that because we had a couple of individuals on one of them, John Odenkirk, and, and we had a couple of guides on and, and the grass is stagnated this year. It's not coming up as well. And it's hard because you have to find that good mix of hydrilla. And I think the guy that ended up winning it found a clump that he had to himself. And it was actually it was further north than generally going to the beach or, or places. And that's what they call it down in Aquia. But again, like that place just gets the shit pounded out of it. And it's hard for that place to hold up for for three days. I mean, I think the guy that won the last, um, uh, I forget what the hell he called it, the FLW basically tour. I think he was the Italian. But yeah, he went to the Potomac Creek. I mean, he hauled ass all the way down to Potomac Creek yep. just to get to a grass bed by himself. And so, oh, Galele. yes, yes, Galele. Yep. Um, But no, you're right. And I just, I just, it's, this is why I think it's hard for guys that live here to win it is they don't have that. I think it's hard to have that open mind for title because you know you can find maybe one small clump of grass and you can win it there easily in local stuff. 
But then when you go to a Toyota series where you have 200, 300 boats, dude, like one grass clump, if anyone else finds that you're screwed, like you can't do that. Like it's so hard. No. And the problem with it is, you know, and this kind of goes both ways. Uh, it kind of depends on how you look at it. The first and second day of the tournaments are open days, in my opinion. That's 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 open season. Like if, if we take off day one, you beat me to a spot because you have an earlier boat draw. If I have an earlier boat draw on day two and that's where I want to go, I'm going to go and I'm going to fish that spot. You know, it's not it's 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 not a penalty to me. Mm-hmm. you got a better bow draw than I did. But I'm going to make sure that on the day that I can make it there, I'm going to make it there and I'm going to catch it. Some guys might not find that correct. Personally, I do. But there's so much relying on that if you go down south that I'll stay where no, where the other boats are to where if I'm a late bow draw, ah. Nobody's going to beat me there anyway because I'm not going to have to worry about nobody fishing around me. Mm -hmm. And that's luckily it has worked out well for me doing that. Now, could that change? Yes. But just based off the past few years and how guys approach that place and whenever you look up articles, when you look, go look up articles, the Potomac River, you're going to hear the same five or six creeks the entire time. You might have an odd one thrown in there every now and then. But for the most part, you're always going to have the same ones. So they do. They produce good fish. They do. And that's just so weird. And, and that's why I, I keep coming back to it is easy. It's easy to maintain good points at a title place like the Potomac. It's hard to just say you're going to win it and call your shot. Right. Like I, I know I could go cash a check or, or get good points and I could just sit in Mad Woman all day after a couple of tournaments I've already gone through and it's going to suck. And there's a lot of boats, but I know if I had to keep points, I could do that. Right. And it's easy because like, you're right. There's like four or five places in their community holes, which kind of makes it good. It's just the psycho, the psychological part of just knowing like you're going to have a shit ton of people around you. Right. If you go off like you do, you can win the tournament, but you could bomb or you can sit in the crowd and know you might not win, but you'll cash a check. And that, that's such right. a weird mentality. And, and I guess I'm going to turn this back around before, before we start answer the rest of the questions, get out of here. Does that help you that mindset when you're fishing in Ohio where all the places are about four acres and there's 200 boats or you go to a TVA and you have so many people around you? Like I, that had to have helped going to the Potomac river and dealing with boats around you and feeling okay with it. Cause I know a lot of people that get claustrophobic when they go to Potomac. It's like, God, there are people around you. And I love how you said like the, you catch one, they start getting tighter and tighter and tighter. That is the Potomac special. Right oh there. yeah. Oh yeah. Um, you know, it's funny you mentioned that cause this past year, we went to Indian for that first BFL, and I had one fish right off the bat, and I went the entire day, and all I caught was big, giant saw guy, 23, 24 inches, dude, just hammered under docks, like smoking a jig, and I'm sitting there looking, I'm like, get the net, and there's giant saw guy. So, very end of the day, I roll into this spot, I roll into this little creek, and there's eight other boats in there. And I go under this bridge I got to bend down on. And as soon as I pop up, I look at all these boats. And every single one of them has a bait caster with a little tiny crawl on it. Every single person in their boaters, co anglers, nobody has a spinning rod. Nobody has anything else other than a little flipping crawl. And I got my crawl on. So I put it down, set it down. And reach down, I grab a four inch weightless Senko. And I go down the bank and I catch a two pounder. I go out and then I come right back in and I caught big fish of the tournament, which was like a four eight with like 20 minutes left to go. Right. Mm-hmm. Home. I'm close enough to another boat that I can reach over and me and him can touch hands. Dude, that is- he reached out to me going down this little canal. He was fishing the right. I was fishing the left and I caught one and there were probably six other boats right there watching. And I caught one. And I think really it's figuring out. You got to find the spot within the spot. Because if there's yeah. there's a ton of fish, there there can be a ton of fish. Mm-hmm. Somewhere in that big group of fish, there's one spot that's got the biggest fish in that entire school, and that they, they big fish stay with big fish. Yeah, the way it goes out there, they like all being together, mm-hmm. and figuring out something different as well that everybody else isn't doing. I understand that there's a frog bite it's kind of hard to find something else to do other than just throw a frog. You know, you can change your color. You can do stuff like that. 
but figure out something that you don't see other people doing that you think can give you an edge. And whether that's something that you have confidence in or whether that's just something that you're pulling out of a hat, you will be very surprised how well it works out for you when you just do stuff you're confident in and you're around big. Yeah, I, I did preach it. Like, yeah, I, I think that's something. I think until you fish either your neck of the woods or those big ass tournaments where you have 200 professional anglers on a body of water and they crowd it up so quickly, you don't appreciate that you can't. Hopefully in a perfect world, you can go throw a frog all day and you're fine. Right. But it's, it's it's you being able to go out there and like experiment or look at the field and be like, yeah, I have to make some kind of alternate. Because I see so many pictures of people like go out the tone. It's like, well, they were hammering a chatterbait yesterday. And I have fights with friends here all the time. It's like, I only throw a chatterbait. It's like, that's why I don't throw it. It's because I know you and 700 other people are going to start with that. Yeah, and everybody. It, and so it's like, everybody throws that chatterbait. Everybody, everybody does. And, and I'm sorry. It was like the whopper plopper bite. It's like when that went on, it's like, yeah, they got PTSD from the chopper blades going over their head because everyone threw it. And those fish, I, I, I know in my heart, the big ones will turn off that first. Right. They're educated. Right. Um, they know. Sure. Yeah. And you they, can sick them. You, you can. I mean, you can go yeah. through there and throw chatter bait and run into the fish and you can sack them. But the time between the tide not being right, you're not going to catch them. That's mm. the thing. Like, cause you, you also have to figure out when the tide's not right, what can I do to figure out how to get bonus bites, whether it be a five pound or whether it be your limit fish or whatever it might be. If you can figure out how to get bites when the tide's not right to where you can pick up extra fish or pick up your bonus fish and then catch them when it is right. That's mm -hmm. completing the whole puzzle. Yeah. I preach it. Cause yeah, you, you have a window where you're going to get, and that's the thing that's so fun about title. And I think anywhere I trade, I take this anywhere. You're going to have a, a moment in that tournament where you're going to be able to get right real quick. And mm -hmm. it's about catching fish every now and then between that time that you can get right and understanding that, um, that is just so important. Yep. But no, uh, Jared, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. And if we could just a answer some, a, qu a couple of questions here, so I don't keep you till midnight. No, you're uh, good. <laughs> let's see. First question we got here is, Travis Cyber. And again, guys, please like answer, ask all your questions real here. You fish. Um, that's a pretty good. One. I would say coming in with one to two fish. Um, 50 yards from blast off definitely is a bad feeling, especially if you know that you're on them or you feel that you're around the fish. Um, but you can always make somewhat of an adjustment that day just based off of catch and release fish. You know, I mean, majority of the places the tournaments go out of is a place that's had tournaments there that year already. So you can still figure something out to get bites. And hopefully you don't come in with one to two fish and you break down 50 yards from blast off because that really feels bad. Oh, that, that, that does. But yeah, dude, yeah. You can catch a lot of fish, uh, from blast off. I mean, like there's that one Japanese angler that's on the Bassmasters now and he's like kicking ass and he's always fishing just freaking like community holes. I mean, like that's insane. Like he doesn't care about the pressure, so you can do it. You can do it. Let's see what we got here. Next question. Uh, I guess you might know this person, uh, Lena Martin, who do you love most mom or dad? We, we might have to take that offline, but yeah, that one's even. <laughs> let's see that we got uh no brock j89 when do you fish grass versus wood on the river um i think that they go they would much rather be at grass when the grass is in i think if if there is grass in the areas that you want to focus on i think that's what you need to put all of your resources to is the grass. If there's little grass or it's not topped out grass, I mean, you can get it whenever it's submerged grass, you can get bit. But if the grass isn't topped out, at least for me personally, I don't, I don't like to fish. I don't like to throw a chatterbait. I don't like to throw a swim jig. I don't like to do that sort of stuff. I would much rather have a big stick in my hand, have a finesse stick in my hand, have a top water rod in my hand, and do stuff like that. But if there's no grass, I stick to hardcover 
if the grass is in, I focus on the grass. Because last year, whenever I was there for October, they weren't they weren't on the hard cover. Because I, I fished it one day. I I told myself I said I'm gonna spend one full day. I'm gonna run my national championship milk run, and I'm gonna fish all the hard cover that I can. And I caught one four pounder the entire day, fishing the tides, fishing the stuff I felt that I should be getting bit on. And once I transitioned to grass. I slowly started to piece it together and I slowly started to get bites. And then we ran into that one spot and from there it was on. And it was definitely a grass bite without a doubt. I think, I think that's the key thing is like how much, uh, how much vegetation. Cause I know like when we went up to, um, Oh shoot, when we went up to Chautauqua, like that was something that was interesting. It's like one of the times that we went to Chautauqua, I think it was the first year, the year before you guys, the dock bite wasn't as good because the grass was just so thick and it was everywhere. And then when we went back there the second year, the first thing we tried to do was the grass bite and there wasn't as much of it. And so it was completely off. And so we were just trying to find, you know, pelagic smallmouth, which was completely wrong. If there's not a lot of grass, you can't really, I don't think you can do as well. Like even if, if Belmont Bay, for example, or Pohick, it all had submerged vegetation, good green grass, and it didn't come up to the surface. You could probably win in that bay because there's enough fish to be held there that everyone could do it. But if it's just a couple of clumps, no, there, there, there's, there's no way at all. Uh, at least in my opinion, because I do like fishing grass. And I feel like if, if the grass mat's big enough, uh, you can, it's just, it's stupid how many fish. Like that's when I think you do have those insane 20 minute flurries is on a grass clump. That, cause and, I, don't, I don't know how it works, but it does. Right. And the other thing is, I think that a lot of people over there focus on grass, mm -hmm. whether it's all they look for or whether they're like, you know what, I'm going to stay in those South Creeks and I'm going to go down there where I know the grass is. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of times you can do the off the wall stuff that not everybody does. And you can figure out how to get bites because you don't have everybody else out there doing it. Like, yeah, you might not have the amount of fish that the other guys in the grass mat might have. But if they have 50 fish and there's only a few of them that are big, you might only have seven, eight fish down a stretch, but they're all good. They're mm. all fish that you want. And I, and I like fishing for the quality of the fish more than you know as many bites as i can get and just beat them up because you're gonna have guys coming in on you you have guys getting close to you and that was one of the reasons i left that grass spot here at this last tournament just because there there's just no quality there and i'd hoped that there was and i in practice i had had like 25 top water blow up blow ups in this area and i mean i was like man they, you know they seem like decent fish i don't know i would like to hope that one of them's a four pounder Mm -hmm. And there was enough guys in there that if there was a four pounder, there wasn't very many of them because I saw a lot of the guys weigh in and they were all around that 12, 13 pound range. Mm. Dude. Yeah. That's good stuff. No, you're right. You're right. Um, and this is stuff I think people that are in this area could definitely learn about. Uh, Larry, you said, I don't even know. You said, you said natural bank. What is a natural bank? Natural bank is more or less just bank that hasn't had people on it, whether it be docks, whether it be roads going by or anything like that. I mean, it's just lay downs, it's wood, it's stumps, it's deadheads, it's driftwood. It's just stuff like that. Just stuff that doesn't really look like, it just looks like a regular old bank. Yeah. So like a know nothing type of bank, like it just doesn't yep. look. Yeah, a no nothing type of bank. That's yeah. you would be surprised how shallow they really get on that. That big one I caught on the second day that I landed, I could see the bottom. Like I could see the bottom the whole way up to it. I mean, it looked like that fish was maybe in eight inches, and I made eight different casts at this one giant log laying in the water and never got a bite. And once I got up to it, I cast it right down the side of it to where I had about three inches, is all I was sitting off of it. The fish came up and ate it on the very first go around. And I mean, it was shallow. I mean, she was pretty big, like to the point where you'd be surprised seeing her up there. Like, I was like, ah, I'll throw it on the side of it, but I doubt there's one stacked up on there. Like, you know, you would think it would be, but there was, man. It was daggone big. I, I, that's crazy. Like, and I wonder, cause like up north, that's the one thing I realized, like, when I started fishing docks, like in Champlain and shit, like, I didn't realize how shallow they'll get on some of those docks up there. Like, it's it is. It's stupid. Where you feel like you should be able to see them. Yeah. Like I should see, that's a four pounder. I should see that fish under that dock. And you have no idea. 
Yeah, I remember Billy and I. We would go. We went through this pass, and we were hitting only the first the, the first posts on some of those docks, and it had no bites. And then I, I, I just I was trying to skip back under the dock, and I launched the damn thing until almost it was like on the freaking dirt. And then boom, we get one. We go back through that same set, hitting the as farthest pylon as possible to where it felt like there's no water, and they're right there. And it's like this is the dumbest thing ever. Yep, that they're that shallow. Yep. They will go places that you don't really expect them to be. Mm -hmm. and they will get shallow. But again, like that, that's just so cool. And I guess the last question I guess we have here, guys, so going once, going twice, is going from Cam. Uh, what is your favorite bait? And I'm sorry, Larry. What is your favorite bait and your frog, I guess, frog setup? So frog rod setup. Set up. So I guess, what, what do you like to throw for that? <sighs> for my frog rod, I throw... Uh... Daiwa Tatula Elite 7.3 Medium Heavy Ailer Rod is the one that I throw, and it is a top of the line rod. Let me tell you, I am a huge fan of it. Um, I throw it on a seven one to one Shimano Corrado. I have the old Shimanos. Um, I like the OGs, man. They're they're the best in my opinion. I mean, they're so bad to the bone. Uh, I throw a Terminator Walking Frog, oh, wow. and just like a black bottom. And uh, 65 pounds suffix 832 green braid. Okay. Best. I I throw a lot of braid. I throw a lot of spinning rods. I fish Lake Erie a lot. I tie leaders and all that. And I've tried a lot of different braids. And I've been using 832 now for probably six years. And it's the best stuff on the market. It's unbelievable how nice it is. Dude, that's I pretty love good. That stuff. Yeah, it's sweet. What? I'm going to have to get you back on the show at some point. Just talk about the small mouth setups too. Cause they go, man, hell we didn't even get to talk about that, but I mean, your favorite bait then, I mean, you, you find with the very one. Yeah. Oh, goodness. You're, okay. awesome. Let's do this. How about this? Uh, what are two rods you'll always have on your deck in a tournament? Let's do that instead. I'll always have a jig rod on my deck. Okay. Always have a jig rod on my deck. And the other one, I'll give you two. The one will be a fairy wand with a Senko on it, okay. whether it be a 99% of the time, it's just a Texas rig, four inch green pumpkin Senko, no weight, no nothing, just a do nothing bait that fish absolutely love. If it's not that, it's just a top water, whether it be a walking bait, a pop bar, a buzz bait, frog, just any sort of a top water, mm -hmm. or, but I'll definitely have a jig. I, I got rods that I only tie jigs on. Like, they don't get anything else. They get they get one jig and that's it. One color for a jig. One, to one, color. Your life. one, one color for the rest of my life? Yeah, for a jig. Probably Alabama crawl. Damn, okay. Honestly, probably that orange and green pumpkin, man. I think that's just an unbelievable color. I like catch it. all types of fish on it. It's not that it's black and blue to go to. Mm -hmm. Those are, in my opinion, you look at my box, those are about the only two colors I got. I got some green pumpkin. I got some with a little bit of purple. I might have some black, but Alabama crawl and black and blue. You put a little sweet beaver, or not a sweet beaver, but a missile baits, D bomb on the back. Oh, you're D Bob boy. Okay, yeah. I'm a D Bob kind of guy, man. So at least I know you've been you were kicking my ass for all those years. It was with a jig in hand. So it was, that, it was with a jig in hand. <laughs> Jared, like again, Adrian's prodigal son. Like he did it on the Potomac. Uh yeah. If you ever want to come down here and fish, or if you want to move down here, we we'd love to have you come take our money. Uh <laughs> but yeah, thanks again for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Guys, again, please, please follow him on all of his social handles. Uh like They'll be linked in the episode description when this launches next week. Um, yeah. Is there anyone you to give a shout out to? Sponsors, family, friends? Um, huge thank you to everybody that kind of helps me out and is on my side. Uh, Thomas Door Controls. That's where I work at. I'm a project manager over there. Um, I don't know if any construction people are going to see this or any new construction guys. If you do, give us a call if you need your doors, commercial doors. Uh, that pretty much that's what we specialize in and we'll take care of you. Um, Rapala VMC suffix. Uh, if you guys aren't throwing DTs, crankbaits, if you aren't throwing VMC hooks, if you aren't throwing suffix braid, you're really missing out. 
Uh, I've been throwing them for a long, 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 long time. And, you know, they've always done me really, really well. Costa Sunglasses, Costa Del Mar. Amen. Born on the water. That's that's all there is to it. And that yeah. company was definitely born on the water. Um, yeah, man, that's it, dude. I just – I'm ready to start fishing again. I'm ready to get back on the water. I'm, I'm chomping at the bit. I got back, what, Friday morning at like 2 a.m., Saturday night or Saturday morning, 2 a.m., and I've just been dying to get back out there. So, what's your next tournament? What's your what's your next tournament after after the? Tournament? I got the river. I got the Ohio River. I got Maysville at middle to end of July, and then I got uh, um, Champlain for the next Toyota uh, beginning of August, August 9th through the eleventh. It's Tuesday through Thursday. Is that before or after the big boys go there? Because the the tour the, the God the whatever elite. the hell is the it the elite elite? there? I think yeah. It's I don't, the I don't know if they go before or after us, but I know they go there soon. You got the elites, and then um, the MLF version of that. I guess it's the next one above what you're fishing right now. Is the, pro go circuit? The, the pro circuit's going there. Yeah, they probably are. They always go there. They try to. Yeah. So then that that's going to be sporty. But that's dude. Crazy. Dude, yeah, thanks again, and like all the best, and hopefully we can get you on the show again to really talk about your next tournament, um, just to try to hopefully get you a couple more sponsors to help you really just chase this dream, because, yeah, I mean, it is really cool to see your run, and again, if you ever need anything, you know, please feel free to reach out, and yeah, just good luck the rest of the year, dude. I appreciate it, man. Thank you to, for everybody for tuning in, checking it out. Uh, I'm excited to see how it goes. And uh, good luck for the rest of the year, man. Let me know. I'd, I'd love to come back on. I can talk fishing all day on day. Dude, it is addicting. And again, it guys, like and like and follow him anywhere. And again, guys, please give like and subscribe to the channel. We are the fastest growing outdoor podcast in the Washington, D.C. area. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Later. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by jake's bait and tackle located in winchester virginia if that doesn't get you jacked up i don't know what will